Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ilana Lupsha, and I'm the National Networks Program Coordinator at the Advanced Propulsion Center UK, which coordinates the Road to COP26 program of activity. Thank you all for joining um, on our fourth event of the series, where today we will be discussing the electric machines topic and how investing in the UK capability can lead to innovation and development of the supply chain, um, as well as innovation in this area, in order to support UK's transition to a net zero future. We are joined today by an expert panel, starting with, um, with the MP for Warwick and Leamington Spa and chair of the all party parliamentary group on electric vehicles, Matt Western. We will then continue with a keynote presentation from Tim Warmer, CTO of Yasa, and move on to case studies presentations from Tony Campbell, Chief Executive Motorcycle um, Industry Association, Chris White, um, Europe Electrification and Global Engineering Alignment Manager at Ford, James Goss, CEO of Motor Design Limited. And we will move on to a uh, half an hour Q&A session. So please feel free to, to ask your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen all throughout um, the webinar, and we will pick up on those questions in the Q&A session. You have the opportunity to use the chat function for any general discussion, engaging with our panelists or other members of the audience. Please note that today's webinar is recorded and um, the full webinar recording, as well as a short highlights reel will be available this week for all attendees. As well as at the end of the webinar, uh, you will have the opportunity to share your thoughts with us in a short um, survey. I will now hand over to Matt Western. And can I start by really thanking uh, all of you for joining us here today and thank you to the Advanced Propulsion Center uh, for hosting this important event. I was privileged to get the opportunity to, to visit the APC, gosh, feels like about 18 months ago, but in the time distortion of the last 16 months, it's probably two and a half years ago. And it's a, a really impressive facility and doing terrific work, getting funding and supporting uh, businesses and organizations to develop uh, cutting edge uh, technologies, so building supply chains and investment in the facilities that will answer some of the biggest challenges we face in achieving green transport. Um, it's also benefited, I would add, uh, from uh, some government funding, important funding, uh, alongside the Faraday uh, Battery Challenge, uh, and that has been really important in contributing to its work. Um, there's no greater challenge uh, than addressing the climate emergency. Um, I spoke just yesterday at an event uh, organized by the uh, Warwick University and supported by Warwick Manufacturing Group and Warwick Business School, looking at sustainability just in Coventry and Warwickshire, it's something I've been passionate about a long, for a long time. Uh, 11 years ago, I wanted to build a very um, electric house, which is this building here, um, and was thwarted at the time, despite the great technologies and the, um, the initiatives and innovation that was coming out then. Um, but I eventually got round to it. And I think in the last 11 years, I've used something like 91 cubic meters of gas uh, for cooking. Now, you could say I didn't cook that much, or you could say that's actually not a bad figure, particularly in the current uh, situation. But how we deliver sustainability is really important. And uh, the, the report from the United Nations Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change is a stark reminder just uh, about the climate crisis and its immediacy. Uh, uh, and uh, the longer term uh, threat. And that threat, I guess, is really about not doing anything, accepting there might be a climate emergency, but actually not being so much in denial, but actually delaying. And uh, we need to get on with it. And I think the important thing is actually providing frameworks, vision, and that so uh, businesses such as yours uh, can actually understand how to invest, what the horizons are, and to develop the technologies to meet those uh, challenges. And with COP26 approaching, what are we now, three weeks away? Um, uh, it's, uh, the, this country has to show uh, leadership uh, on the issue. And it's something that I've been calling for in Parliament, as I'm sure you would hope and expect. Um, of course, transport, surface transport is uh, a major contributor. 27% total emissions in 2019. Uh, and 91% of that total uh, came from uh, road transport vehicles. Uh, cars, taxis, 61% uh, of total emissions, HGV, 18%, vans, at 17%. Now, as chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Electric Vehicles, which I took over in 2019, 
I've been campaigning with colleagues uh, for greater in investment in infrastructure and consumer incentives. You know, I think the sector has done a terrific job. And it's something like 150 models, I might be slightly out of date there, uh, have been produced by manufacturers. And I'm talking about cars here. I'm not fully up to speed on uh, motorbikes and motor scooters, and I'm sure we'll hear shortly about that. But that's an impressive development and investment that's come through from uh, vehicle manufacturers. And here, Warwick and Leamington is, you know, dare I say, uh, very much at the heart of a good part of the industry with Jaguar Land Rover, Aston Martin down the road, and um, the uh, London taxi uh, company just based outside uh, Coventry uh, as well. Now, uh, with the recent sales reg, uh, reg uh, registrations in September, of course, well down on last year, which was already a bad year, um, but uh, battery electric vehicles, uh, 33,000 sold, uh, accounting for 15% of all new registrations. So that's pretty impressive. The technology is progressing rapidly, but clearly quite a long way to go. And you know, as that technology develops and as the market grows, so I'm sure the costs will start to come down. One of the things, of course, is actually producing, a giga getting gigafactories into our supply chains. And I've been right behind uh, those uh, investments wanting six plants in the UK. As someone who worked in the automotive industry for 24 years myself, I'm uh, really keen that that, that sort of uh, framework is provided by government uh, to give uh, future stability and security to our sector. And there's one we hope to get just up the road here in Coventry. But we need the infrastructure, as I say, to support that. We only have something like 25,000 uh, charge points uh, to date. We need 10 times that uh, it's estimated uh, by 2030. Um, and when it comes to HGVs, my personal view is that um, electric technology might not be the solution to that, um, but Leyland Trucks have uh, invested and are bringing the LF Electric to market uh, this year, which is, uh, is terrific to see. Dennis Eagle, based in my uh, constituency, have just launched the eCollect, the first world's first all electric refuse uh, collection vehicle. And there are many bus uh, businesses, Wright Bus, uh, Alexander Dennis and others, Plaxtons, who are all developing electric and have electric vehicles uh, out on the road. Hydrogen could well be um, a development, uh, the development for HGV. Of course, HGVs have longer uh, to get to um, uh, uh, net zero um, than passenger cars. Uh, but as the Committee on Climate Change said in its report, a hydrogen-based switchover would require 800 refueling stations to be built by 2050 and 90,000 depot-based chargers for electrification if it was down to uh, electrification for that sector. The South Korean government, just to look at uh, leadership, they've set a target of 200,000 hydrogen vehicles and 450 hydrogen refueling stations by 2025. So that's, I think, really impressive, and that's what we're up against. And if we are to attract the inward investment into our automotive uh, sector. Uh, vans, I think it's, there's some good news, of course. Ellesmere Port, um, the plant owned by Stellantis, was General Motors. That facility is going to be producing a new electric van from 2022. And we'll hear about motorcycles, I'm sure. But as I understand, they're going to be fully zero emission at tailpipe from 2035. So overall, um, the support from government has, has been uh, helpful. Uh, we've had 582 million pounds for plug-in car, van, taxi, and motorcycle until 22-23. But you know, I and others are calling for an extension of that in the forthcoming budget CSR. And as I've said, I think there's an urgent need for the government to provide the framework and planning regime to support that. So um, enough from me. Uh, really, it's all about the, uh, the guests that we have today. And Ileana has mentioned who we have uh, for you. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce, first of all, um, Tim uh, Woolmer, who's the founder and chief technology officer of the Asset Produce Electric Motors uh, to the auto industry. So thanks for that. And over to Tim. First of all, thank you very much for the, uh, to the APC for inviting me to, to uh, come and talk to everyone today. It's a, it's a real privilege. Um, I've been asked to speak broadly about how electrical machines um, are setting the pathway towards a net zero emissions. So it's a topic I'm really excited about. Before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about Yas's journey 
um, from a uh, university spin-out. So it's an Oxford University spin-out from 2009. And as some of you uh, may be aware, it was recently acquired in July by Mercedes-Benz. So it's now part of a, a much bigger organization. Um, a, a few pictures, first of all. Um, so in case you can't tell, they, those are images of myself. Um, the, the one on the left is from 2006 when we were putting together the very first um, Yasa axial flux motor. And uh, there, there's a, another one of me, apologies for the uh, self-indulgence, um, when, when Yasa was, uh, or recently after it had been spun out as a, as a business. Now, my PhD supervisor there on the left-hand side, um, the first time he actually saw the, uh, the Yasa topology, this new type of axial flux motor, um, he actually said um, that will never work with a, a wry smile on his face. So really back in 2005, I began this journey to find out whether my supervisor was correct or not. Now, many things have been happening and changing in the world um, over the last 15 or so years. And a very significant thing happened um, very similar time to my PhD starting, which was in 2005, we had the Kyoto Protocol being ratified. And some of you may, may remember, this was the first international treaty to recognize climate change as man-made. And the signing nations made commitments to reducing their emissions. And that, that was the first time that that had happened. I think um, it was a real turning point. Um, again, uh, m many of you may, may or may not remember, but suddenly uh, climate change really came onto the agenda in a, in, a, in a new way. People suddenly became much more focused on man-made climate change and also the impact of things like their daily commute and also their business trips um, when, uh, when, yeah, when they were traveling regularly abroad. Um, but unfortunately back then, the choices to allow people to act on that awareness was somewhat limited. Um, in, in 2005, there were literally no electric cars. This is um, the EV1 by GM, which went out of production in the end of the, the 90s. So uh, in 2005, there were no electric vehicles in production. Um, and the ones that were available were relatively expensive, um, secondhand, slow, hard to charge. And worst of all, they didn't go very far. So they earned the nickname uh, milk floats, uh, probably somewhat fairly. And, and were largely seen as a very much a niche technology. And back in 2005, it was very much diesel and increased fuel economy was seen as the, the solution for, for automotive in the longer term. However, I, I wasn't convinced and um, my PhD back in 2005 was really driven by a very simple question. Why are there no electric cars? And this uh, simple question has driven me and, and also my time at Yasa for, for, for many years, especially when things have got, got tougher. So yeah, when Yasser spun out from Oxford University in 2009, the, uh, the electric car industry was still pretty much non-existent, as I just said. Uh, in fact, Nissan came out with the LEAF only two years later in 2011. So one of the challenges of developing a new technology is you, you really want a, a market for that technology to be sold into. And of course, the big challenge was as we were developing our motors, there really wasn't much of an electric vehicle market to sell them into. But we, um, we continued hard to improve our technology. And if we take a, an average, uh, how much we improved every year over the last years, 10 years, we've pretty much seen a 15% power density improvement year on year. Um, and, and, and of course, efficiency improvements as well, which uh, we're now seeing creeping above 98%. Uh, to put this in context, uh, our motors offer about three times the power density of Teslas, whilst increasing vehicle range and also enabling repeatable performance. So one of the criticisms of some of the Tesla vehicles is you take them to a track or you try to do your, your 60 times a few times and, and, and the, Tesla, uh, the performance can derate. Um, but sometimes uh, numbers can only tell a part of the story. And, over the last 10 years, um, as, as with many startup companies, we've hit many problems, more than you could probably imagine or have time to talk about. Um, we've had to pivot around multiple roadblocks. And out of necessity, we've had to invent our way out of many times of trouble. And this is the great beauty of startups. Your very survival depends on your ability to innovate, and um, more importantly, to innovate fast. If I've learned um, one thing from this journey, 
it's that both um, hardware technology development is difficult and it takes both time and very importantly, patient capital. Um, we often encourage ourselves at Yasser when a new problem arises uh, by saying, if it were easy, uh, we tell ourselves, then others would have done it first. Um, and in a, in a similar vein, I, I recently heard a, a, a joke that resonated quite well with my own journey. I was asked, what's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? And I was told, experience. Yes, that lovely word experience teaches us um, that the optimism of, of youth um, is, is not as straightforward as we believe, and that actually things don't work out by accident, and that simplicity is often the fruit of lots of hard work. Um, now, coming back to, to Yasser a little bit, crucially, our technology found a, a good home. We found the performance market where both weight, uh, performance and package were all really valued as assets. And that's an area where the Yasser technology benchmarks extremely well against traditional radio technology. Um, this has enabled us to win business with companies like Koenigsegg and Ferrari and McLaren. Um, and whilst these projects haven't always been easy, if you imagine we've uh, experienced 60G of vibration and 150 degree temperatures under bonnet in some of these applications, they've helped mature our technology by running it through tens of thousands of hours of testing. And crucially, that they've helped to unlock investments to scale up our production processes. And ultimately these benefits, coupled with the many scars that come from ramping up in production led to the company being acquired by Mercedes-Benz in July. So we now start a new journey, one where we have Mercedes' industrial might um, coupled with Yasser's speed of innovation. And we believe it's a recipe which is going to create some very unique powertrains of the future. Uh, right now, we are designing the next generation AMG all-electric platform, and it's, it's really, truly groundbreaking. We're pretty excited to uh, unveil this in a, in a couple of years' time. Um, but the YES technology is still, uh, is still relatively young, and we have some important roadmap items in front of us uh, where we're going to see many innovations over the next few years. We're looking to reset the bar when it comes to people's expectations for electric cars and help us to get to net zero emissions that bit quicker. So a bit about the industry itself. In the last 10 years, we've seen the car industry completely transform. It's difficult to believe that, like I said, only 10 years ago, the, the Nissan Leaf was launched. We've seen battery prices reduced from about $1,000 per kilowatt hour to closer to 100, a 90% reduction. We see motor power densities increase from the days of the Prius, which were less than one kilowatt per kilogram, up to Tesla, up at five kilowatts per kilogram. And in some cases, we've seen up to 15 kilowatts per kilogram, either through motorsport or some novel topologies like gases. We've seen WLTP efficiencies also dramatically increase from the low 80s up into the mid and high 90s. So if we combine all this innovation, all this hard work over the last 10 years, the, 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 the results are pretty astonishing. We've gone from a 10 year old Nissan Leaf, which I drive by the way, which has got a barely usable range of 75 miles to a staggering 485 mile range, which is now available from the latest Mercedes EQS. That's a 650% increase in 10 years. There are literally hundreds of billions being invested into the EV industry over the coming years. In 2022, there will already be 500 models available globally. And that's a, a pretty staggering transformation in 10 years. So thanks to these radical improvements in performance range um, and cost, electric cars have finally arrived, not only offering cleaner vehicles, but also better vehicles. I'd like to give a, um, uh, a short perspective on the UK, why uh, investing in early stage technology is so important. Um, there, there are many that the APC and other UK bodies have funded. It's, it, it's uh, even just those working in electric motors. I could name a handful of them, like Equip, Equip Make or Integral Powertrain, Protein, Sciata. There's a whole bunch of them um, working in the UK on novel powertrain technology. And of course, we've got James from Motocad, who's going to present just shortly. Um, one thing has become clear to me, though. It's a, it's a difficult journey, and not all technologies, even the deserving ones, will make it. Often the biggest challenges for a new hardware-based technology is buying enough time to mature the technology, whilst also winning the business with a not quite perfect technology you have. 
In parallel, you must continue to innovate at breakneck speed, keep ahead of the competition, whilst building production lines to make your ever evolving product in mass production. And of course, let's not forget the quarterly reporting requirements of your APC project. I've heard it said that it's a bit like jumping out of a, an airplane and being expected to build a parachute on the way down. I'd like to take a, a moment or two just to explain some of the critical roles that the UK funding bodies have played in Yasser's journey. Um, first of all, between 2005 and 2009, um, the DTI, so the Department of Trade and Industry, actually funded my PhD as part of a project to make the world's first hydrogen sports car. So the, the, the very seed of Yasser was, was funded through uh, a government program. Secondly, um, as YESA spun out, and for the first few years, we had a number, number of Innovate UK programs, which really helped to mature the technology and get the TRL up from um, the very low numbers up to the mid numbers. And then critically, just at the right time, the APC popped up and really helped take uh, a technology that was maturing, but link us to um, customers who, who, who were going to take projects into production. And I can't emphasize the critical uh, the critical role that the APC has had in some of the asset success. We had the bow scale project with McLaren. Um, and then after that, we had the AP, uh, another uh, APC project with, uh, with Lotus to do rather than just motors full EDUs. And a, a combination of the APC coupled with regional growth funds, EIS tax uh, relief investments have been the ingredients that have really helped YASA pull together um, uh, uh, yeah, a, 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 an investment piece, which was um, also fundable, fundable from the private sector. We did a little calculation that showed that for every one pound of government grant that we've had, we, we've been able to lever it with five pounds of private investment. And today, Yasser employs around 300 people, training them with critical skills that the UK are gonna need for many years going forward in a, a new world of electrification that we're entering into. So I'm confident that the UK's investments made in Yasser will pay good dividends, both in the short and the medium and the long term. So now, now we're going to move uh, topics a little bit to talk a bit about um, uh, some spillover effects of um, the automotive work with, uh, done with the APC. And one of these spillover effects is that Yasser have done a project with the ATI. So this is the Aerospace Technology Institute called the Axel Project. And on this project, we've collaborated with Rolls-Royce to design, build and fly the world's fastest all electric airplane. Hopefully this will work. There is a little bit of sound, but I'll, um, I'll continue talking while this is uh, hopefully playing in the background. Um, so this plane is called the Spirit of Innovation. And uh, what you're seeing here is it taking off in its maiden flight back in September. And it's powered by three Yasa electric motors. So the plane is capable of reaching more than 300 miles an hour. And I should just note, that's not me flying the plane. Um, the, the project, uh, the, the, the goal of the project was to take axial flux motors that have been proven in serious production in electric cars and apply them into an all electric aircraft. This was a key moment in our business. Through the collaboration process, we managed to prove that high performance, low weight electric motors also translate into aerospace. Um, and oh, there's a bit of sound now. <laughs> you can uh, hear that's the, uh, the propellers aren't completely silent. Um, and so, yeah, one of the purposes of the project was to show that um, automotive technology could spill over into aerospace um, where, where weight and, and efficiency are even more valuable than an automotive. And uh, certainly I'd say that aerospace is the next big frontier for electrification. Um, we currently have uh, billions of people flying. Uh, well, maybe not right now, but we, we have done and will do. And in 2030, COVID willing, it's estimated that around 6 billion people will be flying again. That's over 1 billion tons of CO2 per year. So aerospace today is about 10 to 15 years behind automotive when it comes to electrification. But the opportunity is really an, an exciting. It's not just to make it, it's not just about making existing planes electric. It's also about finding completely new applications for electric flight. Being able to hop from London to Heathrow in an eVTOL, like shown on the screen, or from London to Paris in a fixed wing aeroplane. Fully electric flight has the potential to reshape mobility as we know it within the next two decades. 
and with it, make our cities greener, cleaner, and of course, quieter. And that's why earlier this year, before our acquisition of Mercedes, or by Mercedes, I should say, <laughs> we made the decision to spin out Yasa uh, into a separate, or Yasa's aerospace division into a separate privately owned company. So this enables um, the new business to dedicate purely on electric flight. So on the next slide, you'll see a little bit of branding of our new business, which is called Evolito. So it has a, a live website, so do go and check it out if you're interested. Um, but our key uh, desire was to really empower Evolito to give it the very best chance of, of commercializing the asset core technology, but this time for the aviation market and hopefully making electric flight a reality sooner. So turning back to Yasa and the Mercedes uh, partnership, um, we're, we're now at a point where our motor technology is in serious production. And as I said, the APC have had a hugely critical role in that. And our next generation technology has been planned for the all electric Mercedes AMG platform. It's a very exciting time if you love electric cars like me. Within Mercedes, we're gonna be able to reshape what people all over the world expect from an electric car with fundamentally more efficient and more exciting driving, driving experiences than anyone thought was possible. And we're doing it in a way which preserves the reasons why Yasa was acquired in the first place. Growing our skills here in the UK and helping cement this country's leading position in a global green economy. 15 years on from my uh, PhD question, why are there no electric cars? We should be excited and proud that the UK has had a significant part in accelerating electrification in the automotive sector. But now we can ask ourselves a new question. Why are there new, no, no electric planes? And maybe in 15 years time, we'll know the answer to this question also. I'd like to um, finish with, with a short video, and I hope that sparks your imagination when it comes to the potential of electric machines and how innovation can accelerate our path to net zero. Thank you very much. Every revolution starts with a spark. A spark of curiosity. A spark of energy. A spark of genius. A spark of an idea. A restless, insistent, urgent thought dances around an engineer's mind. If electric vehicles are the future, how will we get there using technology from the past? A single spark floods the brain with electricity, billions of neurons charged with energy, an energy that lights up the imaginations of a passionate team of engineers, dreamers and inventors, and races through the laboratories and workshops of a uniquely agile, dynamic culture. By turning conventional thinking on its head and starting from a completely different place, Yasser's electric motor has re-engineered the future of electric mobility. And suddenly, a spark becomes a revolution. Scalable solutions to the biggest challenges facing our planet gain vital momentum. With more to come and further innovations in the roadmap, electrification is accelerated. Electric vehicles powered by Yasser's revolutionary e-motor already go further, and now, we're going further together with Mercedes-Benz. Accelerating what's possible from electric vehicles. Accelerating towards cleaner, more sustainable transport for all. Because it only takes a spark of brilliance to move the world. Yasser is engineering the electric revolution. And now, with Mercedes-Benz, we will lead it. Tim, thanks very much for that. Really inspiring stuff. Um, what a great story. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you, which we'll come to um, after we've heard from uh, the other panelists today. And next up, we have uh, Tony Campbell. Uh, who, Tony, I'm sorry I've not had a chance to meet with you uh, in the last couple of years um, as part of the APPG. As it happens, I was at Warwick yesterday and I bumped into some young students who've just developed electric uh, power uh, unit for a Norton, uh, which I wasn't aware of at all, but it looked really impressive and I was lo would love to have given it a go. But anyway, Tony, uh, over to you. Uh, very interesting to hear what's happening in the uh, 
in the, the, the world of two wheels. Thanks uh, to the APC for this kind invite for an opportunity to speak. Um, so quick introduction, Tony Campbell, I'm the Chief Executive for the MCIA, which is an acronym for the Motorcycle Industry Association. Um, not everything, just two wheels, which we'll speak about in a moment. So just a quick introduction to the MCIA, then we're going to talk about the category that we represent um, and then the key role we believe uh, that this sector can play in the decarbonisation of road transport. Talk a little bit about the electric power two-wheeler market as it is today and how we see it evolving and then finally what the priorities are for the sector to fully realise this opportunity. Okay, so the MCIA, we're the trade body representing the B2B side of the sector. So we have a, over 170 companies in membership. Uh, that is whole vehicle manufacturers. That's the components uh, and accessories that are fit, fitted to those vehicles. That also includes the rider and safety wear and also companies that provide services to our sector. We represent the full scope of the L category. So not just two wheels. And you can see from the imagery at the bottom of the slide, uh, anything that sits within this space. And of course, our main role is to provide support to our members in all key areas. So technical, regulatory, policy, government affairs, uh, market intelligence. And then we also put on a number of shows and events. Uh, and of course, engage with our members through a whole calendar of meetings throughout the year. So quite boldly and fast into this EPTW space, so if you just keep clicking through and you can see some examples here, there's the new BMW electric scooter, the Toyota iRoad, which is a fully enclosed lean in three wheeler, the DPD truck. Uh, we have electric mopeds in sharing schemes around Europe. Uh, here's a, a 125cc equivalent, so an 11 kilowatt uh, moped with the remo removable battery and then a couple of uh, examples of uh, fully electric motorcycles. So just a really short video to really spark your interest here. We, we did actually produce this a couple of years ago, but it's still very, very relevant about how this sector is really going to play its game, particularly in the urban and suburban space. Cars, vans, bikes, and everything in between. The evolution of our roads in the last 50 years has been dramatic, but not compared with the changes we must embrace in the next decade. The need to reduce congestion, to improve air quality, put us on the brink of immeasurable change, a transport revolution. Single occupancy cars and lightly laden vans will be driven out in favor of more energy efficient, less road hungry vehicles. Walking, using public transport and cycling will rightly be promoted as the greener options, but they won't fulfill every transport scenario. Choosing the right vehicle for the right journey is where powered light vehicles come in. PLVs are practical, efficient and safe. Just a 10% modal shift from private cars to PLVs would result in a 12% reduction in journey time delay for everyone, according to our study. Their smaller size and weight means that with the same 10% modal shift, emissions of NOx and particulate matter fall significantly. Electrification of PLVs offers further benefits, with zero emissions and better energy efficiency than larger vehicles. They have a significant role to play in the first mile and every urban mile, as well as last mile deliveries. But creating a safe environment for them as we move towards the long-term objective of achieving zero casualties on our roads remains a priority. As we adapt to a new transport future, where choosing the right vehicle for the right journey is key, the role PLVs have to play in local and national transport policy must not be overlooked. Okay, so um, there's a quick view of how we see this sector and, and the important role that it's going to play. If we think about city planning, town planning, and what we've already started to see around how can we free up more urban space, um, but still be able to move goods and people very efficiently. And this is where we believe the electric L category sector can, can really play, play a key role. If we look here, you can see that the volumes, relatively speaking, are quite low. Uh, so as of the end of, uh, at the end of uh, this year, you can see uh, from the slide below, and if you add up the two lines, the blue and the uh, the, the red line, uh, the orange line, sorry, you can see that we're looking at a market of around 5,000 units this year, but we are expecting exponential growth as we saw see more and more people turn into these vehicle types. This doesn't include, these are registered vehicles, 
and doesn't include uh, micro mobility and e step scooters, um, which uh, we know that are being fairly widely used uh, illegally at this moment in time. So, how do we see the user type? So, we're already seeing a sales mix moving toward utilities. So, when I spoke about you know the motorcycle sector, the motorcycle sector has very much been dominated by leisure use, but really not really little understood at the moment in time, 65% of their use is for business commuting and utility with only 35% leisure. We believe within five years, we will see that weight increase in the business commuting utility, including last mile, um, and the emphasis moving more away from leisure. That doesn't mean to say we see the market shrinking for leisure. We actually see that remaining fairly static. But what we do see is we see this growth um, in the use for business commuting and utility. So what's really going to accelerate those market influences with the affordability for sure. Last mile, COVID, I think without question, has had a big, big impact. And of course, government policy and the decarbonisation of transport will accelerate this change further still. Where does the sector fit in and, and what's next? Well, first and foremost, L category has now been recognised as part of the solution from the work that we've done. Uh, the video we run was a demonstration of that. Uh, and a lot of effort and work with the DFT, um, we've now been recognised as, as part of that solution. Uh, so how are we going to realise it? Well, MCIA, along with Zemo, uh, as a collaboration, have been tasked to create an action plan that's going to set out how this can be, can, can, can maximise the opportunity of the sector. We'll be launching the action plan at the NEC on December the 7th. So via the APC, if you would like to be invited to that event, uh, please let us know um, and we'd be happily, happily welcome you there. And that action plan, although we're doing it in collaboration with, uh, with Zemo, um, we will be working very closely with the DFT. Uh, they have tasked us to do it and we uh, are looking to get their support and, and make sure it's got the DFT endorsement. And then realising that actually on, an, on a na nationwide basis, so we're going to be supporting the DFT to put, put together a local authority toolkit. So how can we implement what looks or is actually a really great idea um, and, uh, and be able to fully maximise this within the sort of road infrastructure and town planning? So from a regulatory perspective, um, I think we would be fair to say that L category L2 through to L7 is certainly fit for um, so the L category, L2 to L7, uh, we think is fit for purpose, but we do believe that L1 needs to review, uh, needs review. There's too many barriers and influence on cost. So we think there is some space and we are currently, uh, we will be responding to a regulatory consultation that's live at the moment with the DFT uh, to propose a new L0 and, L and L8 category uh, to be proposed. We need to make electrification simple. And of course, uh, the regulation that we have in place at the moment is obviously born out of many years of internal combustion engine, but, but driven by many other, uh, as I say, motivations. Products without question are evolving quickly, and therefore the regulatory framework must be future proof. Uh, but of, of course, it must ensure quality, standards and safety for, for, the, for the consumer. So uh, I think this message is an important message because as we start to migrate into how we're going to introduce these new vehicle types into into the environments we see today it's being cautious and this is the message i guess to the town city planners you know don't block the solution we have to have a change of mindset we have to create safe space we have to ensure that we provide and can provide efficient personal mobility and give the, the you know give, give give people a freedom of choice and then of course there's last mile delivery so in this very quick decision space that we seem to be operating in at the moment where we're very quick to restrict access it's important we fully understand you know the good bad and the ugly making sure that we don't block uh, what what is uh, an obvious choice there's a lot of talk, particularly in automotive, uh, around infrastructure. I think one of the big benefits for the L category and how we can make these, you know, 
bring to market much quicker is unlike cars and vans, the infrastructure on L category vehicles can be far less demanding. Many new vehicles have a cassette type batteries, so easy homework plays charging uh, via a normal 13 amp three pin plug. So that, you know that's really important. There's recently five major manufacturers in our sector have signed up to a common platform solution. So that, you know, this will be key. Uh, and then concepts shown on battery vending stations, some manufacturers already liaising on joint solutions. So uh, again, I think the, I was at an event last week with the UK Petrol Industry Association. I think they're very keen to understand how the, what are now petrol and diesel forecourts and how they're going to modify and move into this new space uh, that is arriving more quickly than uh, we ever fully expected. Tony, many thanks for that. Um, and yes, we'll take questions at the end. Just very conscious of time, we'll move on speedily now uh, to Chris White from Ford, Ford's uh, uh, Ford of Europe's electrification manager. Chris, over to you. Today I want to talk about skills and the skills that we need to get electric machines into, uh, into mass production. Um, and that's primarily been the focus of uh, a project I've been leading, an APC project called E-Prime. Um, just a quick, a quick little bit about me. Um, so I've been with Ford 29 years. And, um, you know, four, four or five years ago, I was managing a team of uh, over 50 engineers. And we were investing, you know, significant amounts in engine, the assembly of engines, of internal combustion engines. You can see from the spider web on the right um all of the, the the different plants in all different parts of europe and beyond in south africa and, and and mexico and other locations where our teams work producing engines for for all of our vehicles um since then i've been the e-prime project manager and uh from 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 now onwards when the project closes in 2020 at the end of this year um we have no plans for for, for significant ice programs um, and uh, we have almost as, as, as much of an investment now planned for major battery and, and e-drive facilities uh, across Europe. So this is the, uh, the e-prime project. As you can see on the left, the really key part of that, it was developing core skills within manufacturing engineering um, to be able to take all of our engineers and transition them really to being able to produce uh, factories that can make e-drives and batteries. How did we do that? Well, we built a scale-up facility, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment, uh, where we were able to run at rate and understand the equipment that we were going to need. But also that, that we built up this huge legacy, this huge footprint of, of ICE um, equipment that we need to figure out how we are going to repurpose. And so also at the same time, looking at that equipment and deciding how we are going to repurpose it and using some of the latest technology, some of the latest digital technology to be able to uh, to prove those concepts um, so that we could move as quickly as we have. As part of a consortium, um, one of the things to recognize within the manufacturing skill set is that it, it goes right through the supply base. So from research technology organizations like HSMI, um, component and, and system suppliers like National Instruments and Siemens, equipment manufacturers like Frolic, and then obviously ourselves, but also those who support us on things like data analytics, like signal noise and SkillNet, who are a training provider. So this is the facility, uh, fully complete now. Um, in terms of electric machines, uh, we can make hairpin stators, permanent magnet rotors, and, and, and represents over 22 million pounds worth of investment in the project overall. Um, we, as I say, have e-motor, stator, rotor, in process and end of line testing systems. Um, we have uh, a whole variety of ways of, of, of controlling quality. Um, we have a training facility um, on site where people can get hands on um, experience with the machines, but then also go and sit in a, in a high quality environment and, and, and train and learn about them. And all that is supported by a whole bunch of digital factual, factory tools. So augmented and virtual reality, the whole building has a 5G mobile private network. And, we, and it's all been built as a digital twin. So virtually you can, you can work with a facility too. In terms of people, um, our organization is, is around 80 manufacturing engineers who've all been retained and reskilled. Um, the, uh, the, vendor, um, the vendors of those equipment, pieces of equipment have obviously been in and done uh, training. 
Uh, we've led in-house training, so lots of the training is bespoke, run by the Ford team, for the Ford team. We've got safety modules that have been written around electric vehicles. We've done tear downing, tear, tear down of, of machines and benchmarking of machines. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time with the supply base through the APC and the network that they bring. We spent a lot of time with the supply base understanding the components that we're going to be using and putting together. And we've availed ourselves of the uh, the apprenticeship, the government's apprenticeship scheme to get our, our teams also through some, some high level uh, apprentices, apprenticeships. Um, and uh, now we're a, a global source of state and rotor expertise within Ford. So not just for Europe, but also contributing to, to Ford's effort globally um, to, to build facilities uh, across the world. And we're adding another 40 engineering positions um, to our organization um, to take us forward to the next phase. In terms of what that next phase looks like, well, Ford's committed uh, to have 100% of its cars within Europe as, as electric vehicles uh, by 2030, and two thirds of its commercial vehicles to be BEVs or PHEVs by the same date. Uh, the team itself are ready and skilled to deliver e-drive manufacture through Europe and beyond. So we're now working on a variety of projects for various places and, and uh, throughout Europe and some that we will announce shortly. And in terms of that, the Automotive Transformation Fund has been used and accessed to help us highlight opportunities within the UK for, for facilities. So in terms of challenges, um, some key things, some key th thoughts going forward. Um, certainly sustainability is, a, is an issue and designing uh, uh, e-machines that we think uh, can be recycled easily. But also um, thinking about net zero, um, the process itself isn't, isn't clearly net zero. There's energy involved and invested in making e-motors. And as we lay down what's going to be a really significant footprint we're putting some thought into exactly what that footprint should be from an energy perspective so that we can get to a true net zero uh, product and manufacturing process. Um, we're, we're obviously exercised with the, the equipment supply base at the moment, and we know that that's very much constrained and we want to work through um, finding the best people to work with, but also to make sure that uh, we, we have, uh, you know, we have the access that we need to all, this, all the suppliers that can support us globally around the world. And I guess to the, the point you saw earlier, we're not, we're not totally committed to the technology we have at the moment. We're constantly looking and reevaluating you know, other technologies and we'll continue to, to think about that and think about how our facilities have to be flexible going forward. So with that, I'll, I'll hand you back uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the team and the next panelist. Chris, uh, many thanks for that. Um, some impressive work happening at Ford and great to see uh, the expertise really here in the UK um, that's driving um, Ford's uh, efforts globally on this. Uh, now I'd like to bring in our final uh, panelist, which is uh, uh, James Goss. James, CEO of Motor Design Limited uh, that develop uh, electric motor design uh, software. Uh, James, uh, just 10 minutes or just under if you can. Uh, thanks and over to you. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, in this brief presentation today, I'm just gonna give a little bit of an introduction to, to who we are uh, and what we do, a little bit of an overview of some of the collaborative industry projects we've worked on and some of the benefits that we've found um, from those projects. So uh, about Motor Design Limited, uh, the main thing that, that we do is develop uh, software tools used for the design, the modeling, the simulation of electric machines. Um, it's a very much an expert engineering tool and has got a lot, lot of inbuilt knowledge in terms of the design and the manufacturing and the simulation of, of those uh, electric machines. As well as the, the software, we also uh, work on the consultancy side. So we often uh, are developing electric machines uh, for specifications or, or doing uh, analysis for our customers. Um, and we're also involved in a number of research projects. So we do a lot of research um, in the field and, and around electric machines, uh, either trying to push the uh, level of the technology and the push the boundaries of what can be achieved um, or to develop our, our methods to improve our, our simulations and our models uh, of the electric machines. And um, we work in, in those research projects there. A lot of the time they're funded uh, and many of them are collaborative um, with other sort of industry and academic partners. 
And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about some of those projects um, during this presentation. Um, Motor Design Limited, we uh, have a headquarters based in, in Wrexham in the UK, and that's where the majority of um, the company are. We have a, a few people who work also you know, in the US uh, and in Asia, but generally we are, um, we are a small company. Um, but we're a very technical organization and we tend to uh, employ and work with people who uh, have a very high level of education and, and uh, qualification. And I think about 50% uh, of the team MDL have a, have a PhD. We, um, we always have a partnership with a company called ANSYS. So ANSYS are uh, one of the world's leading sort of uh, engineering simulation providers uh, and they uh, work with us to distribute and um, support our software um, worldwide. In terms of uh, MotorCAD software, uh, it's primarily used in the automotive sector. So, uh, you know, companies, OEMs and tier ones uh, are, are our main users and you can see a few examples uh, on the screen there. But we also have a lot of usage uh, of the software in, in other um, industries in particular, in the aerospace sectors, uh, industrial sectors, or, or renewables as well. Um, and this is spread worldwide you know, throughout uh, North America, Asia, and obviously uh, in Europe as well. What we have uh, sort of been doing with the software um, over the last, uh, a little bit longer than the last 10 years, is this kind of uh, evolution that you can see here on the screen. So uh, I guess driven by the, the electrification of, of transport and the uh, more demanding applications for the electric machines, the approach to design and the approach to simulation has gone from uh, a, a, a methodology where you uh, focus on sort of single physics simulation of single operating conditions to, to a, an approach where we have to uh, evaluate all of the different uh, elements of the physics, the electromagnetic, the thermal and the mechanical. We have to do that over a very wide torque speed operating range. And uh, you know, we're often optimizing to maximize efficiency uh, over a drive cycle, for example. We have to do that very rapidly. Um, and the, the electric machine is also, you know, not, not, not uh, standalone and it's integrated as part of a, a powertrain system and our software tools and the, the way that we've developed and uh, the way that the, the approach to design has uh, evolved over the last decade, um, it can be seen here. So uh, I just wanted to sort of briefly mention some of the, the projects that we've worked on uh, in the past that really helped sort of drive the development of the software. Um, and one of these is, is Evokey. So this started back in 2013. It was a large sort of industry collaborative research project um, that, was, that was part funded by, by the government, of course. Um, and partners involved, obviously, you can see on the screen there, Jaguar Land Rover, uh, GKN, some of the universities um, and ourselves. And, and the, the purpose of the project was to design uh, and build three um, electrified vehicle concepts or prototypes and there was a plug-in hybrid uh, a mild hybrid and a, a battery electric vehicle and our role on that project is obviously to work on the design and the modeling and the development of the electric motors uh, in in all of these vehicles to kind of follow on from that project we uh, then had a, a another sort of collaborative industry research project called hvems uh, i think this started in 2017 um, and I guess similar partners, but a little bit different here. It was much more focused uh, on the manufacturing side and, and specifically uh, on the manufacturing of the electric machines. And the first of the project was to develop a, a make-like production facility to investigate and to learn about the, the manufacturing uh, of electric machines uh, in high volume. I, again, our role in the project was to, to work on the design and the development of the electric motor, um, but we obviously had a, a lot of learning on that project uh, about the challenges in terms of uh, manufacturing electric machines in high volume, uh, how we can design for 
uh, for manufacturing and also the variation in, in the process and uh, how that can be needs to be taken account of uh, as part of our design uh, process. Um, so, I mean, one of the benefits of, of these industry projects, well, it gives us uh, a completely different perspective, one that you wouldn't be able uh, to get if you weren't uh, involved in the projects, either from, you know, the customer side and the development of the electric machines, uh, but also on the, on the manufacturing side. And it, uh, it's sort of linked to that. It really helps us understand the requirements um, of our customers and our users, uh, because to be deeply involved in that project, you can really uh, understand their role and understand their, their challenges. Um, it also allows you to discover, discover the opportunities to find out what their problems are, what their challenges are, uh, and, and propose innovative solutions to that, uh, which you, you can then develop you know, into your products or as part um, of your solutions. And, and then I guess the, the final benefit there that, that we've been able to uh, sort of see in these projects is, is being able to access the data. Uh, you know, as, uh, from the HVENS project, we had a lot of data that came out from the manufacturing line, uh, which we had to look at and analyze and understand. And, and also, uh, you know, things like drive cycles and testing um, of the vehicles in the Avoki project. So, uh, so a very sort of very brief uh, presentation there, but I think just to summarize, MotorCAD is really a key tool in the development of electric machines throughout the world. Uh, and its usage has grown really dramatically uh, in the last few years. It's used across industries and across sectors uh, in different regions for the multi-physics design uh, and optimization of the electric machines. Uh, and it allows the electric machines to be designed faster and cheaper with high levels of efficiency uh, and power density. Um, by being involved in collaborative research projects, this has allowed us to um, improve and develop MotorCAD uh, beyond where it would have been without those, those projects. And it's really a key aspect um, of our development process uh, and it continues to be. So, I mean, those projects are just two examples uh, that, I, that I talked about. We're involved in many more uh, and they're ongoing and this continues to, to drive the, the development and, and the evolution of our, of our software. So, so thank you for listening, uh, and that's the, that's the end of the presentation. So we've heard from all four of our panellists, and thank you uh, so much uh, so far uh, for your questions uh, uh, that have come in. Please do continue sending them in. Uh, can I just start with a question uh, that came in a little earlier um, from Abdel Jalil from REE Automotive, which is a question uh, for you, Tim. Um, and uh, that was, uh, his question was, what is the biggest challenge that the axial flux uh, machine faces to compete with and be used as, a, as wide as the radial flux in terms of cost, high speed issues, NVH, et cetera. I say NVH, et cetera. I don't understand mm -hmm. that personally, but hopefully <laughs> you'll, you'll explain that to me as well. So uh, NVH being sort of an acronym for noise, vibration, harshness is um, um, de definitely one of the challenges. We, we've had to innovate quite a lot in that space. Um, quite, a, quite a few patents around um, some noise cancelling techniques and some other um, techniques just to get an axial flux machine competitive with a radial flux machine. So there are some spaces which it will be better, um, some spaces which will, it, it will be worse. But of course, everyone, once an expectation has been set, you, you, you kind of have to be as good everywhere and, 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 and better in some places. Um, but, I, but I think um, probably the, to come back to your, your question, the, the biggest challenge has been um, the lack of suppliers to make the machines in, in volume. So with, with radial machines, if you want to buy a lamination stack or a winding machine, um, there's a, a, a broad catalogue of companies you can go to. If you want to buy simulation software, as James just said, you, you, there's lots of very advanced, uh, mature simulation tools. So it means that you can get up and running designing and manufacturing quite, quite quickly. Um, one of the biggest challenges we've had is we've had to develop all the tools from scratch to design the machines. And then we've had to also develop the machines from scratch to, to make the motors. So if you come and look around our production facility, probably 60% of the machines are actually designed in-house by YASA from ground up. And that takes a lot of money, a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of people and development activity. 
Now, um, that 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 will probably change over time. There will become more suppliers uh, available, but that's certainly been the biggest challenge we faced in the last ten years, I'd say. But that's a, a very good question. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, uh, I think there was a question for you, uh, Chris, uh, which was from Yi Jun Liu, which I think you may have answered in the chat. Uh, is was that uh, Yi Jun? Is that okay? Is that you've had your question answered? I guess it has. Otherwise, you would have responded uh, with a further question. Do you want, is is that good? Okay. Um, Fine, in which case, uh, another question for Tim, uh, which was from Wei Lang Chung. Uh, he asked, does the Daimler-Benz partnership mean that all new EVs from the company will be driven by axial flux motors? No. That's uh, a potential yeah. issue, I don't know. Yeah, so, so the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the, the technology has been specified on uh, a number of platforms, all of, uh, AMG's sort of high performance platforms from 2025 onwards will use the, the axial flux technology. And there, there's still um, obviously an expectation that this will filter down into some even higher volume applications. So that, that, that's about a million motors already that we've got visibility of. Um, there's a, a likelihood it will get used on more programs go, going forward. Um, but again, it, it's all about finding um, where where does the technology match best with the the vehicle requirements um, and particularly in the high performance space like I said there's a big advantage of the technology um, as we scale into higher volumes um, we, we have to um, evaluate whether yeah from a particularly a, a cost point of view whether we can um, get get below the uh, aggressive costs of radio machines but that is absolutely the plan fine um, thanks for that uh, Tim um, any other questions uh, coming in? I'm just having a look through the chat. Can't see anything there. Um, actually, here's a point. The um, one of the big issues we we discussed this at the sustainability uh, conference yesterday, which was really about um, recycling. Um, and and I guess the question is why is all or is it recycling electric machines? Um, is that economical? Um, and how can we minimize uh, its environmental impact? I know that there's some work going on at Warwick University or WMG about that. Um, any comments, Chris? Well, yeah, it's something we're very interested in. And we, you know, um, there's a, another question coming on the chat around uh, rare earth magnet based motors and we would we would love to find alternatives. We, we're working hard on that at this point in time. Um, we don't believe there is an alternative we can put into production. Um, but in terms of uh, recycling, yeah, interesting conversations with the recycling industry. Um, really, you know, no no real significant um, view that you could uh, that it'd be worth your while to try and separate out metal types within an existing motor. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the perhaps the, the best way to recycle a motor is to kind of crunch it up and, uh, and try and separate out metal types from, from what you get, you get at this point in time. But obviously, um, that's something we're interested in looking at, magnets that are, oh, sorry, motors that are better for, uh, for disassembly. So we've got a project running at the moment around um, how we might assemble magnets into rotors in a way that they might be then removable i can't go into too much more detail than that but uh that's certainly an area that we're very keen to to explore because we recognize clearly the value of uh neodymium 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 that's the uh that's the rare earth metal we're talking about in, in magnets right. right i seem to be coming across new um i sort of remember the old sort of uh chart on the, the wall in school and i'm just trying to think neodymium i don't remember that being <laughs> Maybe yeah, I don't remember it in the periodic table either. But it, no, it's <laughs> probably right down the bottom corner or something. Um, just, just on that, really. I mean, it, clearly, uh, we talked about supply chain issues, and um, here we are with issues about power, uh, power supply, the manufacturing uh, cost of uh, manu manufacturing uh, battery uh, power units is relatively high, as I understand it. 
Um, any comments on that one point? And then secondly, really about sourcing materials such as neodymium um, and, and others. Uh, lithium, I understand, we can get from Cornwall. Uh, there is the deposits there. But sort of other materials that uh, might be on the horizon and, and the dependency may be, say, on China or um, in Bolivia or wherever it is and elsewhere. Chris? Yeah, so um, responsible sourcing is something we're looking very hard at, um, certainly for the materials that we use within within batteries. I guess one of the, you know, to, to the start of your question, you talked about kind of current um, issues. And one of the, course, the, the most current issue we're all facing within the automotive industry is the, the lack of uh, semiconductors and the impact that's having on production in our plants today, right? There's most of the, uh, most of the auto industry is well below capacity purely because we can't get, or we haven't, we've come out badly from the, the pandemic with regard to semiconductor supply. So lots of thought going into how we might uh, we might secure better supplies of that, but also it's driving a discussion around um, more vertical integration. So, for example, today um, our strategy doesn't include power electronics. Um, we, 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 we plan to buy that in in the next generation of motors, but some discussion and thought is going into well, actually, you know, should we should we be assembling uh, power electronics ourselves? Should we be partnering with people for power electronics? Um, and I think we can see potentially some of the issues around material supply starting to drive more vertical integration in the industry. I guess that's the, the, the question is now with the, um, the, the semiconductor uh, challenge right now globally. And with, you know, sort of obsessed, I think, for many observers, certainly in, poli in the political sphere, about how vital batteries are. But, but where do we sit in terms of the manufacture of motors? And perhaps you don't want to talk about um, the future manufacture of, of motors, but maybe, Tony, you might want to come in on this as well, about where you see, and maybe come back to Tim as well to contribute, um, how much of that we th you think uh, could actually be delivered as, as high-value manufacturing and with the, whether we would be able to have the supply chain here in the UK? I, I think raw materials will always be a challenge, but uh, but I certainly think there's a place within the UK for for, for assembly of of a number of these components um, with with the right level of support and and skills. You know, as I talked about, skills are going to be critical to making sure that we can deliver all of this in in the volume that's going to be needed. Um, you know, Tim talked about a million motors. Um, and and that's at the high end of the industry. Imagine what's needed for. Uh, sort of a company like Ford in terms of the number of motors that, that, that we, we, we are planning to produce before 2030? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think um, um, as ever, we have to play to our strengths in the UK um, and, and also play to the strengths that we find in different, different places in, in, in Europe. So uh, I think in the UK, where we prove ourselves time and time again at being very capable, is um, speed of innovation. Um, I think uh, pilot production is fantastic in the UK. Um, th there are obviously good exemplars of um, automotive scale up to high volume in the UK as well, like in Sunderland and um, yeah, various factors of factories around the UK. So I, I think there are some good opportunities. Um, again, I think as, as, as was just mentioned, um, the critical thing is getting that balance of um, government incentives and support um, to, to make the business case around putting high volume facilities in the UK and also getting the right the right skills as, as was just mentioned as well um, but yeah I, I don't see any I don't see any specific roadblocks there's 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 a lot of opportunities because there's going to be a huge number of factories being planned for and built in the next five to ten years no question James, do you want to come in on that, uh, perhaps? I'm just interested. Uh, one of the things I always remember was talking to John Egan, and he said when he, I think he was at JLR, or Jaguar rather, um, but uh, when there was a change of ownership, they, did, they had so few people with PhDs in the organisation, how that compared uh, to when uh, BMW took over um, the remnants of, of Austin 
Rover, I think it was at the time, and and uh, Land Rover. I mean, you were very, you have a huge capacity in terms of skills and design engineers. Uh, where do you see uh, motor design and manufacture here in the UK? Well, I think we've we've got a very strong um, strong base in the UK in terms of the universities. So uh, there's there's some excellent universities in the UK that specialise in electric machines whether it's sort of Warwick or Bristol or Nottingham, Manchester, uh, Newcastle, they, they, all, they all have, and I'm sure I've forgotten a couple as well, or Sheffield, of course, um, but they all have very strong, strong uh, capabilities. Uh, and there is, a, there is a good you know, output of, of PhDs uh, from there that, that go into industry. Um, but having said that, that, that there's, there's always a shortage really uh, and and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of recruitment from from overseas as well uh, to to try and get the skills that we need. So uh, yeah, I, I think we we could always do with more uh, more skills. And I think a lot of what we're doing is recruiting people maybe from uh, you know other fields and training them because we you know there's not there's not people there. Uh, available with the the specific electric machine expertise but there's a lot of young clever people who have the capability to, to learn um and learn the field and, and getting people to to you know I, I always believed it's a bit like the premier league in football if i may use that analogy um we want the best engineers um from wherever to come over and and so on getting people into this country with the skills and chris was talking about um, the apprenticeship levy and using that to develop uh, skills from within. Um, do you think we we are attracting those sorts of people um, as well from abroad? Yeah. Um, well, it's an interesting question. I I, I guess um, I guess we we used to uh, attract quite a lot of people um, from from Europe. Um, uh, I haven't seen a huge issue since Brexit, although although the number of people may be uh, interested in sort of coming over and working with us has, has reduced slightly. Um, but but I think one of the things is a lot of people are attracted to coming to the UK uh, just, just because of the, the language and, and they want to learn English. They see that as the, uh, the way in which that they can sort of um, build a, a base and then they can go elsewhere and uh, travel around the world. So uh, I, I think there's a there's a big advantage actually we have just just from that aspect, and we get a lot of people from France and, and Italy who who want to come and and uh, sort of spend some years working with us. Very good, Chris. I see there's a question coming to the chat um, asking about uh, the. It looks like there might be an ongoing conversation between yourself and Eugen. Uh, um, yeah, but he was just asking about whether the motor casing is made in aluminium alloy, and if so, would that would the thermal conductivity of the casing material be an important factor? Well, it is. Yeah, I'll take. I, we've swapped emails as well, so I'll I'll take that kind of offline if you like. Um, just just picking up on your last point, Matt. So around uh, around bringing emo, uh, motor production to the UK, you know, it's something we're very interested in doing, and and hopefully, you know. We can we can get to some decisions around that fairly soon, but the key some of the key things. So we talked about skills and we talked about government support and making sure that, that, that we're on a level playing field from that perspective. Um, I'd say there's there's another political answer to that, which of course is about um, the movement of parts. You know, it's very clear we talked about rare earth metals and materials that come from from outside of the UK, and clearly a company like Ford makes vehicles elsewhere. So making the e-drives here, we have to have, you know, that 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 those sorts of trade deals that allow us to do that. And, and they will be always there. They're kind of the elephant in the room in terms of make of decision making for us. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not the I'm not the politician, but I'm sure those things will uh, will, will play out in the fullness of time. We've certainly seen um, some 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 clarity now from Brexit, um, but, but clearly there's more more to come. OK, uh, just perhaps uh, one point, really, and um, reminds me of some, some research I was doing about 10, 15 years ago and just how I mean, I remember um, from uh, Malcolm Sayer was um, a, a brilliant mathematician who, you know, his how he applied his maths to the design of the E-type, for example. 
Uh, but sort of in this area, you had people who sort of started developing the fixed wing aircraft in the Coventry Warwickshire area. And how there was this, this sort of crossover between sort of the automotive sector and other product sectors. And you, know, you think about all, all sorts of product developments and how that's happened. Do you think there's much opportunity for sort of crossover between the renewable sector, um, say, uh, wind turbine sector, the work Rolls-Royce is doing and others, and the lines of work you're involved? Fantastic example. Recently, we were, we were looking at um, um, carbon fibres. Obviously, lightweighting is a big part for us as well. You know, getting cars lighter um, is key to, to, to everything we're doing here. And um, somebody's realised that, that the... The, the number of wind turbines out there that are actually coming out of commission and the site the, the materials that are effectively waste from 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 spent wind turbines is huge and the, the opportunity to recycle and reuse those within the industry so yeah I think, I think there are all sorts of strange um, opportunities for us to collaborate and um, you know I think that will will definitely play out in time you know we obviously saw with Yasa the the, the, the parallels between you know high performance sports cars and, and and aviation and the need for motors there so yeah i can definitely see that uh, more and more our worlds will, will come closer together i maybe could just add to that as well i'd say that uh you know a lot of the tools that we've developed over the last few years have been been pushed by the the automotive sector but that that's benefiting i mean particularly the aerospace sector for sure uh, you know, it's, it's almost directly transferable, all the methods and the tools that we've we've developed. And it's it's the same problem. It's just slightly different objectives and slightly different goals. But, um, yeah, there, there, there's a there's a lot of benefit, not just not just aerospace for industry renewables as well, um, that, that the sort of electrification in the automotive sector has uh, has driven. Tim, can I bring you in on that? I mean, clearly, you've actually got Evo, Evo Lito. Um, in your um, in your uh, fold, uh, but also whether there's kind of reverse thinking about not just using energy, but using the motor in reverse, for want of a better term, to to generate generate power. Yeah, we, we we're very excited. I think about just what what's happening in aerospace and the opportunities there, um, and, and just the fit with the technology is really good as well. So in terms of all these metrics, like like James was saying, there's so much transfer between automotive and aerospace automotive is pushing for more performance for weight down um, and of course aerospace just puts that on uh, yeah, to, to, to a new level um, and of course a bit less cost cost sensitive as well so um, uh, and then you, your second question do, do you mind just repeat explaining that a little bit more what, what you meant well God, you, that's a really dangerous thing I was just wondering whether uh, there is the, how you, you can use turbines um, or the motor that you've created, but use the, the motor in reverse to actually mm -hmm. not uh, create power, but uh, to drive it, but actually use it in some means uh, for that motor to generate um, from renewables, whether it be sort of wave uh, energy or something. So, so in, in, in other sectors, you mean, is, is yeah. the technology transferable? Um, exactly. And and it, it, it could be. So generally speaking, renewable type projects require, if you take wind turbines, for example, um, they're, they're very, very low speed, very big diameter, high, high torque machines, sort of up in the mega newton meters. So um, whilst the fundamental magnetics could certainly be um, moved over into those kind of different, very different machine types there, um, that, that it would it would require quite a big development work to 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 kind of yeah redevelop the machines into a yeah something suitable. So it's, it's not impossible, um, but the step whilst there's quite a lot of synergy between automotive and aerospace, the, the step into so um, things like big wind turbines or, or other types of renewables would be yeah it's quite a big change. Great. Well, look, um, thank you. We, we're more or less there uh, to time. Um, uh, I, I found this immensely uh, interesting and stimulating. Um, and it's, it's one of those um, seminars or conferences where, you know, you, you, you just, every, every few minutes you find yourself sort of learning something uh, pretty revolutionary that you weren't aware of uh, actually 
uh, going on um, and just how rich uh, the development potential is here in the UK. What's spinning out of our universities? Um, Oxford, Tim, uh, James, I think you were at Warwick, uh, but so many of um, our universities, Loughborough, Nottingham, Bristol, all over the Newcastle, all over the UK, uh, we have some really leading minds on this, um, which is, is, is so um, reassuring uh, to hear and to see. Um, and, and I really hope that uh, this will have been a great interest to, to everyone who's joined us and thank you for joining us. But I, I, I do so, I'm so keen to see uh, these, this innovation, this, these ideas, um, marry with investment, marry with uh, the, the means and, and will to produce here in the UK, because so much of the value, I mean, course, originates from the, the development and the origination. But I think it's critical, of course, to our future manufacturing. Uh, uh, I was on a call earlier or a conference uh, looking with the SMMT, a global trade supply uh, conference, just talking about how vital it is uh, that we have these these technologies being produced here in the UK for our future manufacturing uh, to to remain uh, in on these shores. So um, what I would say is thanks to uh, the Advanced Propulsion Centre, thanks uh, to everyone involved uh, for pulling uh, today's conference uh, together. Thanks again to you all for joining us, and um, uh, hopefully. If I may just say, I would love to come and visit you, um, James, Chris, um, Tim, uh, and then also Tony, uh, you're up the road there in Coventry. But genuinely, this is stuff of real interest and perhaps I can bring other members of the All-Party Parliamentary Motor Group or Electric Vehicle Group to come and visit and talk, talk with you. So thanks very much all and have a good rest of the day.